this episode of Trying Not to Sink, we replace our inverter with this brand new Victron and install a new battery bank. Let's get started. My name is Ed. I'm an ex-musician, turned politician, turned accountant, who now imagines himself a sea captain. This is Lynn. She's an ex-model, retired photographer, and the love of my life. Three years ago, we bought a boat. No experience and completely clueless. Since then, we have traveled over 10,000 miles along the Atlantic coast and the Bahamas. Join us as we continue the adventure, exploring exciting places, meeting new people, and having the time of our lives while trying not to sink. I am far from an expert when it comes to inverters and batteries. What I'm gonna to present to you is my opinion based on the research I've done. Now, if you have other information or you know something that might be helpful to me or to some of the other subscribers, please message us below. When we purchased our boat, it came with an Outback 32 volt inverter. Unfortunately, the inverter was broken. We attempted to have it repaired down in Fort Lauderdale, but it turned out that it wasn't really cost effective based on what was wrong with it. Unfortunately, Outback stopped making 32 volt inverters. And as far as we know, no one makes 32 volt inverters. So we had no choice but to switch over to either a 12 or 24 volt system. Now we decided to go with the Victron 24 volt. The reason we chose 24 volt over 12, well, there's several reasons. One is you can build bigger systems with 24 volt inverters. Things like solar chargers are less expensive. Uh, because the amperage is lower, the size of the wires that you need are lower. There's a, there's a lot of reasons. The bottom line comes down to, if you're gonna build a decent size system, you really wanna to go to 24 volt. In fact, a lot of houses, when you do your own home, they even go to 48 volt. Now the Victron is a 24 volt, 3000 watt inverter charger. And we decided to go with the Victron, mostly because they have a great reputation. We've seen them in a lot of marine applications. They're a little on the pricier side for inverters, but um, we did not want to have to go out and replace it anytime soon, so we decided to go with a good name brand. Now, we also decided to add a new battery bank. Well, we didn't actually decide to. We didn't really have much of a choice anyway because we couldn't get a 32 volt inverter. However, we were happy to do that. In fact, that's what we wanted to do anyway. We like knowing that no matter what we're doing as far as um, running uh, our house, that it's not gonna be affecting our regular 32 volt batteries, um, perhaps jeopardizing our ability to start the boat or run the 32 volt systems that are hooked up. Uh, also, by having a separate battery bank, it's gonna give us a, a better longevity on the current 32 volt banks that we have, and that's a plus as well. Now, there are two main types of batteries that you can use in your house banks and your inverters. Uh, there's lead acid and there's lithium. There's various types of lead acid, but it basically comes down to those two types of batteries. We decided to go with the lithium batteries uh, for multiple reasons. There is a lot of information about the difference between lead acid and lithium batteries on the internet and YouTube, so you can feel free to look that up. I'll give you some of the highlights of why we chose lithium. First of all, they cycle more often, or you can cycle them more often. A typical lithium battery may be able to cycle 4,000, 5,000 times. Whereas a lead acid battery, you're really limited to maybe four or 500 times. So these can, in theory, last 10 times longer. In addition to having a higher number of cycles available to you, you can also use more of the power in the battery. For example, a lead acid battery, you can typically only use a draw it down to say 50% before you need to recharge it. On a lithium battery, you can take it down to 10% of its capacity. Some batteries even tell you you can go to zero. Uh, in other words, it gives you a lot more power for, for the battery. You need to replace a single lithium battery with say two lead acid batteries just to get the same amount of discharge. So basically that means that a lithium battery, you're really able to use about 90% of the amp hours in the battery, whereas on a lead acid battery, you're really limited to about maybe 40, 50% of the amp hours. And that's a big difference, especially if space is a consideration, uh, like it is on, on most boats, uh, weight is a consideration. So you can get more bang for your buck in, a, in, in real estate space if you get lithium batteries and that was that was important to us and uh, let me give you an example based on our boat now we have two battery banks on our boat they're both 32 volt battery banks and they have 8d batteries in them uh, they're 8 volt batteries uh, wired in series for them to give us 32 volts now if you've seen 8d batteries they're about this long and they weigh about 150 pounds now the 8d batteries wired in 32 volts they're 200 amp hours available that gives us 
approximately 2,500 usable watts in those batteries. Now the two batteries we are installing are 138 amp hours each. We're gonna wire them in series at 24 volts, so the amp hours will stay the same at 138. Uh, however, it will yield altogether about 3,300 watts. That's about 20% more than the huge 8D battery banks that we have now, and it will take up perhaps 20% of the space. Here's another way to look at it. A good quality lead acid battery, say an AGM, 12 volts yielding 100 uh, amp hours, is going to set you back about $250, and it's going to produce about 1200 watts. Now only 40% of that is usable, so you're looking at about 480 usable watts. The battery costs $250 divided by the available watts, and you end up with 52 cents a watt, which is pretty good. A lithium battery, say again 12 volts, 100 amp hours, uh, is also going to yield 1200 watts, but about 90% of it will be available to you, so you have about 1080 of usable watts in a lithium battery. Now the lithium batteries are much more expensive, you're going to pay at least $800 for a lithium battery. So when you kind of figure out the usable watts versus the cost, you end up at maybe I think it's about 74 cents a watt. Now that is considerably higher, about 42% higher than the lead acid battery, but keep in mind they're going to last 10 times longer and take up 20-25% of the space. Now I don't want to get too deep into the woods about lithium versus lead acid. There is a lot of information on the internet. There are plenty of videos that can teach you everything you need to know about this. But for our purposes, the lithium, it just turned out to be a no-brainer. Now let's take a look at what we purchased. These are Valence batteries. They are 138 amp hour, 12 volt batteries. They're very high end batteries. They have built in VMS. Uh, they cost about $1,600 new. They are good for four to 5,000 cycles. However, I purchased these used on eBay. I got them for $450. Uh, they have about four or 500 cycles on them. So there's about at least 3,500 left, maybe more. Um, the way I see it, they're going to last me longer than I need them to last me. I'm probably going to use them anchoring out underway 100 cycles a year. At that rate, they'll last 35 years. Now, even if they're half, they last half as long as they're supposed to, that's still 17 years. I guess the bottom line is this. I think that these batteries used in the good condition that they are will last me no less than 10 years. And by that time, there's gonna be some new technology around that makes these obsolete anyway. So let's do a little bit of math how it comes out buying these used balanced batteries. So I'm gonna make a, a couple of assumptions. I'm gonna say that since they're used, maybe they'll only charge up to 90% of their original uh, capacity. And let's say that I draw them down to 10%, giving me about an 80% yield out of their amp hours. That'll give me somewhere around 1,325 usable watts out of these batteries. Now they cost $450 each, so that's going to come out to somewhere around 34 cents a watt. Uh, that's about 34% cheaper than lead acid batteries, so again, it seems like a no-brainer to me. Now our plan is to wire these batteries in series for 24 volts, yielding a maximum of somewhere around 3,300 watts each. And if everything goes right and we're happy with these batteries, we plan to purchase two more and wire them in, giving us somewhere close to 7,000 possible watts for the boat. More like 6,000 usable. Uh, we think that is more than sufficient to power all of the non-220 items on our boat. We're also going to hook up an off-board BMS battery management system. They do have them built in, but they actually require an off-board module that will uh, communicate with the onboard BMS in the battery. I'll get into that a little bit later as we're doing the install. Let's get started. I'm here in the generator room, and that is where we are going to install the inverter. Our old inverter, the Outback, was installed right here as well. There's a spot for it. I had a little spot to mount it up on the wall, which I've already done. I plan to install some of the switches and fuses around here, and I believe I'm going to put the two batteries right here. That's the current thinking. If not, I might put them here. So, there's the Victron mounted on a piece of plywood that I attached to the wall. Our previous inverter, the Outback, sat right here, and uh, it was just connected to our, our main battery bank. So, I have two here, well, one bank 
four batteries and then the other bank is over there. I have the lid off because I'm adding water. We have everything installed and ready to power up. Let me just go over some of the components with you now. Now over here to the side we have of course the batteries. Now on the batteries, I'll follow the wires, we have uh, the positive coming out, we have the negative. The positive cable is running to a fuse. From the fuse, it runs to a switch for on off and then it goes up into the inverter. The negative cable comes off the battery, goes down to a shunt right over here. And then from the shunt, it goes up into the charger. Now what the shunt does is it senses the, uh, the battery voltages. It's basically a battery monitor. And you can see some cables coming off of the shunt there. The two red wires run up to the positive and the negative terminals. And there is a communications cable coming out of it as well, which is running into the, the hallway. And I'm going to mount that someplace where it's easy to see. Now also on the batteries you can see we have another cable coming off the negative end where I have the two joined together for series. Now what that is is a temperature sensor that comes off and that also runs over to the Victron. And that's basically the system for now. There are some things I'm going to need to do such as pro uh, programming the batteries or programming the Victron rather uh, to match the batteries and I'll be doing that probably next weekend I need to download some software and but for right now I am going to power everything up and see if it's working let's keep our fingers crossed before I power up let me talk a little bit about how we wired this in the boat now our boat has three main AC power panels there's one down in the engine room that's strictly for air conditioning. These are the two main ones that we use. The top one is mostly dedicated to 220 systems, hot water heaters, stoves, things of that nature. Whereas the bottom one is geared mostly for 110 items, outlets, the refrigerator, ice maker. We have wired the power going to the inverter from this 220 board, only using one leg, of course, to give it 110. Now we've done that specifically. There are two ways you can install your inverter. You can do it as a pass-through or a non-pass-through. A pass-through would be if I were to say take the power coming onto the yacht, run it through the inverter prior to coming to my circuit panels. Uh, that would enable the inverter to sense when there's power on or off, turn itself on or off, or even assist power from the dock. I decided I didn't want to do that. I really do not want this inverter turning on unless I want to turn it on. Um, and on top of that, our boat actually takes 100 amps of power from the shore. Uh, I can't feed 100 amps through it anyway, so it would be only halfway there even if I decided to do a pass-through. So what I've done is I've run it from the power going to the inverter from the 220 panel. The reason I chose the 220 panel is because I will never use this with the inverter. I'll never try to power this and thereby creating a loop where the inverter is sending power which is coming back to power the inverter and I didn't want anything like that to happen. So we're powering it through the 220. The inverter is going to send power to the 110 panel. And the way it does that, if you look at our main power selectors over here, this is our generator. This is Shore Power 1, Shore Power 2. I've wired the Shore Power 1 so that there's a dial here. Instead of going to Cable 1 or, or Cable 2 out there, I have an inverter selection. So I can turn this to inverter when I want to use the inverter. And these are the three main panels that I talked about. And I can tell them where to get their power. So if I turn this to inverter, Shore Power 1, I can come down here and say Shore Power 1, 4 panel, uh, well, panel 3, which is the 110, this is 220 down for the air conditioners, and this is the 220 up here. So these will never go to Shore Power 1. They'll be turned to Shore Power 2 or, or whatever. Uh, anyway, that is the way we did it. I'm sure there's, there's lots of ways to do this, but I'm comfortable with this, knowing that I'm going to manually control when the inverter comes on and what it is powering, and it's not going to happen when I'm away from the boat or uh, anything like that. So... Let's give it a shot. Yeah. Okay, well, 
you can see from the uh, battery monitor, we have 26.14 volts. That's good. I am going to now turn on the selector switch to the on position, which is actually number two. And that should send power to the inverter, which I'll now turn on. Inverter on. Light came on. Okay, I guess that's a good sign. Notice the battery monitor jumped down from 26.14 to 26.08, and I'm assuming that's because it takes a little bit of power to actually run the inverter. I'm gonna, I will now go turn some of the 110 systems on and see, uh, see how we're doing. I may not have mentioned earlier, but the shunt that monitors the battery is Bluetooth enabled. So it is transferring over to my phone. It's sending the information and you can see right now I'm running 25 volts roughly. We are pulling 30 amps right now. And that's because I think the block heaters are on the 110 system. And well, we'll see, I'll start removing things and kind of get a handle on what we want to run off this and what we don't. But right now, 30 amps, it's running practically everything on this boat with the exception of the air conditioners and the hot water heater. According to this, we've consumed 2.3 amp hours of energy already, and we only have about four hours of power left. I'm going to see what happens by disconnecting the block heaters and just see how that goes. Okay, I turned the block heaters off, and you can see now we are only drawing 15 amps, giving us about six and a half hours worth of uh, reserve battery power. Well, so far I'm very impressed. That's, that's as much as we need. And uh, it's only two batteries. I plan to add two more, so we should we should be a pretty good system. On the next episode of Trying Not to Sink, we install 400 watts of solar panels on the flybridge. Best of all, we got them for free. Stay tuned, and we'll show you how you can get them for free as well. <laughs>